Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Summer in Indiana, and that means it's time for you to take another tank trip with us at the Weekly Special. Yes, so join us in Lafayette. We cannot wait to show you around this beautiful, historic, and fun city. Visit a seventh generation family farm, one of the oldest homesteads in Lafayette, and explore the Han Mansion Museum. Relive your childhood at Main Street Amusements, and take a walk on the wild side at Battlegrounds Wolf Park. It's all coming up here in Lafayette on the Weekly Special. Welcome to the Weekly Special, I'm Erica Sagone. And I'm Daryl Neer. We're standing here on a pedestrian bridge that connects West Lafayette, home of Purdue University, to historic downtown Lafayette right behind us. We're going to begin our exploration of Lafayette by visiting Wea Creek Orchard, owned and operated by descendants of some of Lafayette's original pioneers. On a little hill just outside of town sits a property that has been a gathering place for thousands of years an archaeological site once home to the indigenous Wea tribe. When the European settlers arrived, the land became home to one of the first pioneer families in Tippecanoe. John Hoover uh, patented this land from the government in 1829 out of the Crawfordsville office. And he just kind of let the land lay for quite a while, 162 acres. And then my seventh generation removed, grandfather, bought it in 1855, had his family here. They put up two barns that you see over here. The house is an original house, stone foundation, hand dug basement, and they just did commodity crops. My mother's father grew up here, was born here in 1913, and I'm now seventh generation on the place. It just came from one to another to another and inherited down. After growing up on a small farm nearby, Perry left Indiana to pursue a career in immunology. But after his grandmother became ill and his mother inherited the property, Perry moved back to Lafayette, took a job at Purdue, and he, along with his siblings, returned to the beloved family farm. I'd always wanted to come back to the farm because I loved it, and of course it was a big part of my family. We used to come here and play. When we came back, all this was just pasture land right in through here. So we thought, let's go ahead and turn this into an orchard. With the guidance of expert Purdue horticulturists, the family planted 360 apple trees per acre. Trying to go through all those hundreds, thousands of permutations about when do you thin, what do you plant, how do you stake it up, how do you prune, all those sorts of things has a very steep learning curve. So I still get to do science, but I had farming in my blood and I've always liked growing things. There's something real satisfying about growing things. You can do mind demanding things during the day and come out here and work on trees, work with your hands, have space, just to be able to have a place to have your grandkids play and let the dogs run. And the family felt it was important to share that space with their community, creating a U-Pick experience featuring fresh seasonal crops, including peaches, nectarines, and even honey. We get a lot of people out here every year. We get a lot of field trips. And it's fun to be able to share this with another generation of kids. When we walk people out into the orchard, we tell them a lot about the history. They'll want to see the things we found in the barn when we came here. They'll want to see the arrowheads that we found. Just things like that, that people see a connection to the land. All that gets spread through the family, and we all have a different story to tell. It's special to us. And each family member has a unique role. Perry's dad loves building new inventions for the farm. His mom plays matriarch, taking care of the flowers and cooking for the farm crew. His sister can be found coordinating the farm's events, and his brother manages the finances. It's that sense of family that Perry believes has made the orchard a success. I think a big part of it is we were very close to my grandmother, who was very much a people person. We knew that this is something my grandmother would love, and we knew that my grandfather was very strongly interested in keeping things in the family and making sure family understood history and loyalty. And there's a lot of things we could do with the place. I mean, we could put up corn mazes and things like that that are very successful around here, but we want this to be a place of peace. And I think people really like that. They can just walk 
Doesn't cost them a dime. They can walk out here and take pictures. They walk out here and do arrowhead hunting. They walk out here and just look at the trees. Hopefully in 200 years, the land will still be in the family and they can say, look at the generations who've come through. They try to keep the land as it is. It's been used by people, for people, for 170 years now. And I think it's legacy as much as anything. Peach season is just around the corner. Find hours and directions, including information about the family's market at their website. Like the Wea Orchard family, Moses Fowler built this residence in 1850 after arriving in Lafayette in 1839. And Erica, the house is arguably the finest example of Gothic revival architecture in the state of Indiana. It's now owned by the 1852 Foundation and it's used for private events, weddings and tours. One thing about the community of Lafayette is its strong commitment to historic preservation. And as our next story shows, that commitment extends far beyond the city. In 1904, St. Louis hosted the World's Fair to commemorate the centennial anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase. Built on 1,200 acres, the fair featured over 1,500 buildings with showcases from across the world and exhibits representing each U.S. state. Of the original buildings, only 12 remain today, including the Connecticut State Pavilion, now known as the Han Mansion. Connecticut decided they were going to do something that was very historical, which was different than most of the buildings, and this was supposed to represent a, a gentleman's country home. It was patterned after the Lydia Sigourney home in Hartford, Connecticut, which was built in 1820, and a lot of the components were taken from the 1760 Hubbard Slater Mansion in Norwich, Connecticut, and so a lot of those were hand-carved before the Declaration of Independence. This house at the fairgrounds was, was really one of the favorites. It, although it was very small, it was very homey, and people just felt like it was the home of their fathers. In particular, Mrs. Fanny Potter, the young wife of Lafayette attorney William Potter. She fell so in love with the house that at the close of the fair, she insisted her husband make an offer, and the mansion was purchased for $3,000. Piece by piece, it was dismantled, numbered, and sent by the Wabash Railroad. Mr. Potter hired an architect to make the necessary changes for family living, including converting the first floor veranda into a kitchen, the second floor administrative offices into bedrooms, and replacing the plaster exterior with brilliant brick. The rebuilt mansion was one of the grandest houses and happiest gathering place in Lafayette's historic 9th Street Hill neighborhood. But when the house passed to the second generation, the community gathering ceased. We lived in the neighborhood, and so we would walk past and, and say, wouldn't you just love to see the inside of that house? And, and we never dreamed we would. And I asked the wrong person the, the right question and ended up with a house. <laughs> I think it was love at first sight. <laughs> the form was nice, but it was in horrible condition. But when you looked at the center staircase, it just had such character. Over the years, the Han family worked tediously to repair the mansion. In order to afford the renovations, Ellie and her husband Bob did much of the work themselves, replacing the electrical and plumbing systems, refurbishing woodwork, and even hanging wallpaper, all in an effort to restore the home's former glory. When you have something that's very historic, um, it has a story and, and it's important to us that, that it keeps telling the same story. It's a community treasure and people are always curious about buildings that have not been open for a long time. We had people come knocking on the door and saying, I'd like to have a wedding here or this or that. And it was a pretty good feeling to, to share the house. Even as the home became a community gathering place once again, Bob still felt like something was missing. We were sitting in the, in the drawing room one night and, and I said, you know, Ellie, we should have an art collection. She said, that sounds like a good idea. And I said, why don't we make an Indian art collection? She said, that's a good idea. And that's how it happened. And from there we started. We bought all the books we could find on Indiana art, and, and we, we both read all the books, and I, and I would go through and look at the pictures all the time until I got in my own mind a firm view of what good art was and the good artist, then we knew how to pursue it, and that's what we did. Today, the Hans Collection is considered the best collection of Indiana art in the country. Over 100 artists are represented, including celebrated painters from the Hoosier Group such as T.C. Steele and Otto Stark, as well as members of the Brown County Art Colony. In addition to the paintings, visitors can enjoy a stunning display of American Renaissance Revival furniture seen throughout the home. 
We had no plans to make a museum when we bought the house. It just so happened, it got to the point where other museums started coming and borrowing pieces. We realized that it was a really important collection and it was important to keep it together. We feel that the Indiana artists are among the best in the whole country. A lot of these artists could have gone to New York and, and become wealthy and, and much more famous than they did in their lifetimes, um, but they loved Indiana and they chose to paint here and their work is just really incredible. And we want other people to know what it is. The Hans continue to add to the museum, including many contemporary paintings and decorative ceramics, highlighting over 100 years of Indiana tradition. In 2015, Ellie and Bob stunned the Lafayette community when after 30 years of calling the mansion home, they gifted the property to the Museum Board of Directors. We didn't feel that we could make the museum successful and, and gain the public support we needed as long as it was our personal house. It would just still be people going to see Bob and Ellie's house. We'd like to get to the point where people all over the state know the museum and, and want to come here to see the art. I think it gives them a sense of pride in their heritage to understand about Indiana art, and I think if you're a, a Hoosier, you're not considered as cosmopolitan as somebody from New York, but if you have art from, from the Hoosier land that's as good as any other art from any area, then all of a sudden you, don't, you feel a little better about your state. Daryl, the Han Mansion is a treasure, not just for Lafayette, but for Indiana. And we had to know just a little bit more about this beautiful place. So we're here with Flo, the executive director. Thanks for being with us here today. Thank you. You know, you take a look at this beautiful home and all that's inside it. Yeah. And actually, the exciting thing that's happening at the home right now is not inside, but it's outside in the backyard. There's a sculpture garden going in. So tell us a little bit more about that. You're right. We've got three outdoor features here at the museum. We have a hiking trail. Um, that's a one mile trail. Then we have a very rugged mountain bike trail. But the big project this summer is installing a sculpture garden. It will be filled with 15 or more sculptures, all by Indiana artists. And we just broke ground on Friday to put in the trail, which will be a handicap accessible path. So there's construction going on every day, and it is really exciting to see that happening. When will the sculpture garden be open to the public? We're looking at having a grand opening sometime early fall. Great. Well, a new wonderful part of the home to check out. Yeah. Flo, thank you so much for thank giving you. us just a little bit more insight into this beautiful mansion. And if you'd like more information, visit hanmuseum.org to discover special exhibits and events. Well, thanks again, Flo. We sure appreciate it. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Well, Erica, the Han Mansion Museum certainly has a wonderful collection of Indiana art. Lafayette is also home to another collection, certainly louder, a lot more interactive, and also quirky. Dan St. John has always had a pinball game or two, but it was a chance encounter while attending a pinball convention with Creature from the Black Lagoon that he credits for starting his obsession. Played the hell out of it that night and ended up buying one and it just got me into pinball again and I picked, I picked up a couple more games and right around then was when I the, the idea to move downtown happened and then I basically bought the building to live upstairs and then I had this extra retail space downstairs and said, you know what, might as well do something fun with it. The game collection was starting to snowball a little bit. I had them at work, I had them in a garage and I said, you know what, I can make a nice little workshop and back to work on them. I can have a nice game room out front. Uh, maybe people come in and play them. If they don't, I've got my own little man cave downstairs. I would have been fine with that. I really didn't know what to expect when they opened the doors for the first time. Uh, but uh, believe it or not, there were people lined up waiting to come in. It's interesting, we, we get people from, all the way from little kids who have to stand on a stool, who can barely reach the flipper buttons, to people considerably older than me, if you can believe that. Some of it for us is the nostalgia thing. We get people that walk by, see us on the street and come in, and oh, I haven't played pinball in 30 years, I'm gonna do that. There's one game they remember playing as a kid, and they'll, they'll just make a beeline for that game and that era of games. Uh, a lot of people are shocked that they're, to find out that they still make pinball machines, and they're, you know, they're still cranking them out. The pinball industry has made quite a comeback in the last few years. We've gone from one manufacturer five years ago to, I believe there are six or seven now, and they're turning out some spectacular games. We've got some classics, some that are just mainstays that'll probably never sell, but a lot of them, uh, if we can turn over maybe 
six or eight or ten games a year, it's enough to keep it fresh in here. Main Street Amusements is now the largest public pinball collection in the state, thanks in part to Dan's meticulous maintenance and love of repairs, keeping the newer games in top condition and reviving the older games back to life. It's funny, for somebody who owns 40 games, I don't play a lot of pinball. So I think I, I get more enjoyment out of repairing them. I, it's, uh, it, it's almost a, it's a detective job. And particularly in older games, a lot of it is just wading through schematics and trying to figure out which little set of contacts might be a millimeter out of adjustment or what little relay isn't closing quite right. Yeah, I, I guess just the satisfaction of bringing one of those back to life. Dan is known in the industry for his well-oiled machines. The reliable gameplay has attracted pinball leagues and professional tournaments, including the highly competitive Main Street Mayhem, which draws champion pinball players from across the country. Each game is slightly different in how you should score and approach it. It just, it, was, it really intrigued me. And they actually have game-specific tutorial videos that are done by previous world champions and they'll walk you through how the game should be played. And then the bottom line is it's, it's studying, it's knowing rules to games, and like what shots you should hit when and what order you should attempt things on a game. And then you go to attempt what they did and you realize there's a reason they're a world champion. And the coolest thing is that even though you are competing, I've never met a pinball player who won't help somebody else out too. It's a very friendly group of people that participate in the hobby. It's just a fun thing. At least once a week somebody will come in here and shake my hand and say thank you so much for opening this place. It gives a lot of people a, a, a fairly cheap entertainment outlet. You can come in here and drop ten bucks and be here for hours sometimes. Those old games are still a quarter. I mean, where else are you going to have fun for a quarter anymore? Take a step back into your childhood. Find out more information about how you can try your skills at msamuse.com. Erica, I can't think of a better place to feel like a kid again than coming out to the zoo. And we're at the Columbian Park Zoo here in Lafayette, Indiana. And joining us is Amber Frederick. She is the education coordinator of the zoo. And Amber, thanks for hosting us here today. Yeah, thanks for coming. Well, my understanding is this is the second oldest zoo in Indiana, founded in 1908. So you've got a rich history. And could you tell us a little bit about the origin story of the zoo? Sure, that's correct. We were founded in 1908 as a municipal zoo here in Lafayette, Indiana. And we celebrated our centennial just a few years ago. We're very excited. We have a, a wonderful little community zoo here. And we've got a really rich history. Over the years we've had just about every kind of animal that you can imagine, everything from bears, snow leopards, even an elephant at one time. But because times change and we want to make sure we have the best available zoo for our community, we embarked on a complete and total renovation project. The zoo closed to the public in 2004 and we began building all new exhibits. We reopened in 2007, so everything you see when you visit today is new construction since 2007, with the exception of one historic building, the Animal House. Well, I, one of the things that really excites me about the zoo is you, you're truly open to anyone with a free admission, and I was wondering if you could talk about how important that policy is to the overall mission and vision of what the zoo tries to do. Sure, we really want to be part of this community and we recognize that this community there are people from all walks of life. So being a free zoo I think really helps people come back week after week, they come back every summer, they'll visit us on a regular basis, which is nice since we're continuing to grow and continuing to develop our master plan. As their families grow, they'll get to continue to experience new and exciting things at the zoo. Currently only about 50% of our grounds footprint is developed, but we have plans for every inch of space here at Columbian Park Zoo. In our six acre facility, we'll be adding more exhibits and more exhibit areas over the coming years. So that'll include an entire area for African species. We'll have a brand new primates area in the future as well as an aviary. I think that'll really complement the exhibit tree that we already have here in place, which is all very family friendly with a lot of uh, opportunities for kids to be immersed within the exhibit, to meet an animal up close, to learn a little bit about it, engage with a zookeeper or one of our educators to find out a little bit more about why that animal is important in our natural ecosystems and here as part of our zoo collection. Well, Amber, thank you so much for sharing the vision of the zoo and what you're really offering this community. It really truly is a gem to, to Lafayette and the state. Well, you're welcome. I'm really glad you enjoyed your visit. Yeah. Plan your visit to this Lafayette gem. Visit their website for information on hours and directions. Amber, thanks for being with us and sharing this wonderful zoo with us as well. You're welcome. 
Now, the Columbian Park Zoo isn't the only place in Lafayette where the wild things are. Come with us to our next location just outside of town that focuses on preservation and education of some very cool creatures. For over 40 years, Tippecanoe has had some very special residents, thanks to the vision of Purdue ethologist Dr. Eric Klinghammer. After studying the animal behavior of doves, an encounter with a fellow ethologist's wolf changed his career. When she met him, he realized, yes, it looks like a dog, but she's definitely not a dog. She's something different. And he always remembered that. And that, plus his interest in conservation and the need to find a new species to study, all kind of came together after he had moved out here and was teaching at Purdue because he had land where he could keep animals like wolves. And so he knew George and Mary Rabb at the Brookfield Zoo. They'd been studying wolves and he got two wolf puppies from them and that was the start of Wolf Park. Established in 1972, the 75-acre facility provided the perfect environment for Klinghammer's research. Together, he and his fellow Wolf Park colleagues published the first Wolf Ethnogram, an encyclopedia of wolf behaviors, vocalizations, and pack dynamics, observed for the first time thanks to his pioneering techniques of socialization for wildlife in captivity. He was familiar with this idea of hand-raising socialized animals that will treat you like a social companion and so you can study them up close. We found that the only way we can compete with this inborn recognition of and preference for real adult canines as opposed to human foster parents is to take the puppies away from their mother when they're less than 21 days old and bottle raise them. So our wolves frequently get to go back and, and be with their mother again for visits. And then if we do our job properly, by the time they're four months old, they can go in with the adults to live and yet they retain their, their strong attachments to humans. And this pays them and us back very much over the span of their lifetime. It takes a lot of the stress out of being forced into proximity with humans by being in captivity because it offers more opportunity for enrichment. And we go in there and we do a little free training, sometimes behavior management training and training for medical husbandry while we're at it and social grooming. When we come in, they will often want to rally with us. A rally is a greeting ceremony that they do with each other, and they will come around and they will want to muzzle greet. It creates an environment where through things like operant conditioning, we can make them more comfortable with certain procedures and we can direct their behavior and, and channel it. Visitors to the park can get an up-close perspective with guided tours, wolf handling demonstrations, and even Howl Night, where audiences have an opportunity for a sing-along with the wolves. But these are not domestic animals. To ensure their safety, each handler must go through extensive training this conscientious approach has helped provide valuable ongoing data for field studies around the world. The research is important because the more you understand about wolves, the more you understand what their needs are and whether, say, if you wanted to introduce wolves into a certain environment, whether they could thrive there or whether they were going to have difficulties. He wanted to awake Americans to the necessity and wisdom of preserving their remaining wilderness. Wolves are a great ambassador animal to speak for their species and also they can sort of serve as a canary in the coal mine for how we're treating our, our wilderness and other large predators. One of the best examples has been the Yellowstone National Wolf Park Project, which reintroduced wolves 60 years after they were killed off by humans. In mere decades, the wolves have revitalized the Yellowstone ecosystem, everything from streams to songbirds. And Dr. Klinghammer was a direct inspiration. The leader of the Yellowstone Project, Douglas Smith, first studied wolves as a high school volunteer at Wolf Park. And it is great testament to the park's ongoing mission. For a lot of families, a trip to Yellowstone or someplace comparable might be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And he really wanted to make a place where uh, researchers could come and study animals. And he also wanted it to be a place where the public can come because he realized that if we don't let people 
form connections with wildlife and with wilderness. And some people can't get to the wilderness, but maybe if they know animals that they've seen at the zoo or at some place like Wolf Park, they'll think, you know, I would feel really badly. I think the earth would be diminished if we killed off all wolves or all humpbacked whales or all grizzly bears. This is one of these things where we're kind of throwing a rock into the water and we can't see from where we're standing how far the ripples will spread. I hope that we will keep children connected with nature and the wilderness and we hope that when they grow up and are old enough to vote that they will keep up on um, laws that are likely to affect how we treat our remaining wilderness areas and the animals that live in them and vote to preserve them. To learn how to see these majestic animals in person, including special events, classes, and tours throughout the summer, visit wolfpark.org. Well, that's all the time we've got for tonight, but there is a ton more to check out in this great city, and we're going to go do that right now. And we hope you'll do the same soon. Good night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 